Okay, we are uh, recording now. And we've been talking where we left off about evolution. And I talked a lot about uh, Darwin. Uh, several of you asked really good questions about evolution that I'll try to address on, on Wednesday if I wasn't able to address them in the, uh, um, in the graded part of the exam. Sorry, still checking the chat just to make sure that uh, there's nothing that needs to be brought to my attention. So Darwin's book that laid out all of this, a uh, book called On the Origin of Species, was published in 1859. By about 1870, just about every scientist who'd studied the matter agreed that some form of evolution was responsible for all biological diversity. Um, there were still lots of questions still to be answered. Um, you know, Darwin's book is not the final word on evolution because there never is, there is no final word in all of science. There's still plenty of research being done uh, expanding on how evolution happened and, uh, you know, expanding Darwin's, uh, Darwin's theory and adding to it and modifying it. But by about 1870, just about everybody agreed that some kind of process that you could study scientifically was ultimately responsible for all life getting here. But, 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 but Darwin's theory of natural selection being the driving force of evolution was not that widely accepted during Darwin's own lifetime. And for natural selection to work, you have to have variation and you have to have heredity. You could sum up natural selection as, excuse me, living things vary. Variation is inherited. It's passed on from one generation to the next. And some of that variation makes a difference. Now, we know that species do vary. You can see this in, you know, your own family, your own classes. Uh, you could look at any population you cared to from the population of stray cats living around the library to the population of clover plants uh, on the, the lawn outside your dorm, anything like that. You could see that they vary and you can observe heredity in your own family, in you know, your own dogs or cats or any other animals that you breed, we know that they work, but Darwin didn't understand how they worked. To be fair, neither did anybody else. So that raises the question of why should organisms vary and how do they pass on that variation? You know, why do you look different from your brother or sister? And yet you and your brother or sister both have traits that look like traits, features that your parents have. Why does that work? And the answer to that nagging question, the big hole in Darwin's theory actually begins here in the Abbey of St. Thomas in the city of Brno in what's now the Czech Republic, uh, what used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 1843, a young man who was born with the name Johann uh, took his vows as a Benedictine monk in the Roman Catholic Church and lived here in the Abbey for the rest of his life. Actually, he did spent some time in Vienna getting a university education, but uh, he spent most of his uh, career here in Brno. Uh, as part of his vows, incidentally, he took a new name. So most people don't know him as Johann. Uh, he's better known as Brother Gregor. So Brother Gregor went off to study at the University of Vienna. He came back to Brno to teach in the monastery school. 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church then as now um, has operates a great many schools uh, for kids. Uh, he taught, he was a good teacher by all accounts. And in his spare time, he was interested in a whole lot of scientific problems. He was a keen amateur scientist. And he got interested in this problem of heredity. Just how do living things make their offspring look like themselves? And in 1856, he got his abbot's permission. The abbot is the chief of the monastery, the head monk, uh, to do some experiments in plant breeding in the monastery garden. Now, the story goes that he originally wanted to do some experiments in crossbreeding rabbits, but the abbot said no, because monks are not supposed to think too much about sex, and rabbits, you know, breed like rabbits, as we say. Uh, so Mendel switched over to peas. Uh, Mendel had grown up on a farm, incidentally, and was already a keen uh, gardener and was familiar with how to grow plants. And these are, you know, common garden peas. These are the ones you can buy in bags frozen in the supermarket. And they were a good choice for his experiments. Uh, peas are pretty easy to grow. Uh, when you're finished with them, you can eat them. So you know, there was that. They would help feed the, the brothers in his monastery. And what's more, they come in a number of different varieties uh, with different features, different traits. So up at the top, you have white flowered peas on the right and purple flowered peas on the left. Uh, all the peas that I have ever grown in my gardens have been white flowered peas. Um, but there are some purple flowered varieties out there. Uh, down below, some peas have pods that are inflated. Uh, there's empty space in them. Um, and so the outside just looks very smooth and cylindrical. To the right, other varieties of pea have pods that are constricted, uh, meaning that they... Um, uh, they fit the seeds much more tightly, and you have these little bumps and valleys on the pot. Uh, there are varieties of peas that grow tall and varieties of peas that are dwarf. Uh, there are varieties of peas where the pods are green when they're mature and others where the pods turn yellow and so on. There's lots of different pea varieties out there. And another thing about peas is flowers contain the sex organs of plants. Uh, when somebody gives you a bouquet of flowers, uh, they're basically giving you a bouquet of severed plant sex organs. Okay, I, I have probably just ruined Valentine's Day memories for you, but that's, sorry, that's the truth. And in typical flowers, the sex organs are out there waving in the breeze surrounded by the petals of the flower. Pea flowers, on the other hand, the sex organs are completely wrapped up by the petals in the center. Uh, this is a pea flower. Um, you have one set of petals making these kind of wings right here. Uh, not that you need to know this, but a flower of this type is called a papillionaceous flower from the French word for butterfly because it looks like a butterfly. So there, we've got the petals right there. And then there's more petals that I'm circling down here, and they're wrapped up around the pea plant's male and female sex organs. Okay, what are those sex organs? Well, there is down at the base of the flower, Flowering plants have at least one ovary, and that contains egg cells. Uh, plants have egg and sperm just the way that animals do. And every one of those egg cells will eventually grow into a seed. Uh, the wall of the ovary ultimately becomes the, uh, uh, ultimately becomes the fruit. Uh, so if you're eating an apple, you're basically eating 
uh, very swollen, uh, very overgrown uh, plant ovary tissue. Yeah, kind of weird, but it's true. Uh, the ovary of a pea is the pod of the pea, and then the egg cells grow into the seeds in the middle of the pea. And connected to that ovary, there's this extension with a pad on the top called the stigma. And the stigma is connected to this extension called the style, which leads to the ovary. Okay. Um, Male parts are these little lumps right here that I'm outlining in blue. Uh, they're called anthers, if you must know, and they're attached to long filaments called stamens. And the anthers produce grains of pollen. Uh, now, pollen is technically not sperm as such, but you can think of it as similar. It'd be more accurate to say that pollen grains contain the sperm. Uh, you all know what pollen is because in about a month, it's going to be all over your car. And you're probably going to be sneezing a lot. Uh, some plants produce lots and lots of pollen. Oak trees, for example, are kind of notorious for it. Um, so that's why your car is going to be covered in yellow dust at about this time uh, next month. Um, a lot of flowers require bees or other insects to carry pollen from one to the other. But what will normally happen in a pea plant is that pollen is produced on these stamens and pollen grains fall off the stamens and stick to the stigma. And from those pollen grains, a little tube grows down to the ovary and the sperm drift down the tube and end up fertilizing the eggs. Pea plants normally fertilize themselves. Um, that's really weird if you think about it from the point of view of animals. I mean, we don't fertilize ourselves. I mean, I've told people to go fertilize themselves, but uh, we can't actually do it. Uh, but many flowering plants can do this. It happens, it happens pretty commonly. Why the heck does all of this matter? Pea plants, as Brother Gregor found, or to give him his full name, Brother Gregor Mendel, he found that pea plants, you could control very carefully what flower was bred to what other flower. He could take one plant, cut open a flower with a sharp knife, and transfer pollen from one flower to another with a very fine brush and then seal the flowers up again with a little bit of sealing wax and they would develop perfectly normally. With most of your flowering plants, if they're just growing in the garden, there's no way to tell which plant is crossbreeding with which other plant. Um, any one plant could be getting pollen from one of its neighbors or maybe another plant of the same species in somebody else's garden. Uh, some plants like oak trees and uh, corn, for example, many grasses, uh, pollen is spread by wind and there's no telling where it might blow in from. You know, an oak tree's egg cells might get fertilized by pollen that blew in from miles away for all we can tell. But because peas have this arrangement where the sex organs are tightly wrapped up, Mendel could control exactly what plant provided the pollen to fertilize what other plants. So he could control which plants were crossbreeding with which other plants. That's probably more than you really wanted to know about flower sex, but it's important. It's important because it enabled Mendel to control what peas were crossbreeding with what other pea plants. And I'll come back to this, but I'll mention it just now. Many times in biology, what we look for is what we call a model system. Um, you could study heredity in any species that you wanted to, but there's technical difficulties with a lot of them. If Mendel had wanted to study heredity in elephants, you know, there's no reason you can't do that. The problem is that elephants 
are very difficult to keep in captivity. They require lots of food. They require lots of space. And since elephant pregnancy lasts two years, it takes a very long time to get the results of any sort of crossbreeding experiment that you might do with elephants. Peas reproduce a lot faster. Uh, they're a lot less dangerous. Uh, they're much less likely to, uh, you know, step on you. Uh, peas cannot kill you the way elephants can if they're mad at you. Uh, peas reproduce much more quickly, so you can do many generations in the time it would take to do one elephant generation. Um, peas don't require nearly as much space and they don't require food. So pea plants turned out to be a good example of what we call a model system, um, a species of organism that just happens to be very convenient for studying some particular thing that you want to study. Uh, some living thing that has characteristics that happen to make it very useful. Uh, so a lot of genetics work to this day is done on, well, one example is uh, fruit flies. And a lot of biological research gets done on mice. And the reason is that they are convenient model systems. Uh, they're easy to raise, easy to grow, and very convenient for demonstrating a lot of things. Uh, we'll see more model systems as we go, but Mendel's model system was Pisum sativum, the garden pea. So he chose several varieties of pea that bred true. What that means is if you just grow these peas and you let them self-fertilize, they will always produce more of the same variety. If you're growing purple flowered peas in your garden, then every purple flowered pea plant will produce seeds that grow into more purple flowered pea plants. And those will produce seeds that grow into even more purple flowered pea plants and so on. For as long as you care to keep growing your peas, you're always going to get purple flowered pea plants. But Mendel wondered what happens if you crossbred two different varieties? What happens if you take a pollen from a purple flowered pea plant and you use it to fertilize the eggs of a white flowered pea plant. You can probably think of several possible hypotheses. It's possible that the offspring would look like one of the parents. Maybe the offspring would all be purple or they'd all be white. Maybe the offspring would be in between and they'd have pink flowers or magenta flowers, or maybe spotted flowers, or maybe flowers that were half purple and half white, or maybe something quite different. There are lots of different possibilities, lots of different hypotheses we could come up with as to what Mendel would get. So he ended up raising 29,000 pea plants uh, using this greenhouse in the monastery garden. Uh, this is the plan of it. The actual greenhouse, unfortunately, has been destroyed, uh, although they've built a replica of it since. Uh, that monastery is now a place you can visit, and they have exhibits about Gregor Mendel's life and work. Something fun to do if you're ever in Brno in uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, we're not going to look at all 29,000 pea plants, so let's look at one set of his crosses. Mendel would take pollen from purple flowered pea plants and use it to fertilize the eggs of white flowered pea plants. Uh, he did it both ways, by the way. He also took pollen from white flowered pea plants and used it to fertilize the eggs of purple flowered pea plants. In this case, it doesn't actually make a difference uh, whether you're using pollen from purple flowered plants to fertilize a white flowered plant or pollen from white flowered plants to fertilize a purple flowered plant. There are cases where that does make a difference, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, for right now, it doesn't matter whether which parent the pollen is coming from. 
And he found that when he crossbred a purple flowered pea plant with a white flowered pea plant, he got seeds. When he planted those, all of the offspring had purple flowers, no exceptions. All of them were purple. All of them were completely purple. Uh, none of them were pinkish or anything like that. Uh, they all looked like the purple flowered parent. Okay, that might not seem like that big a deal, but when he took two of the peas that he produced by that first cross, two of the peas that were hybrids, uh, remember that hybrid, before it came to mean a car that uses both a gas engine and a battery, hybrid means a crossbreeding. Hybrid means what you get when you take two different varieties of some species and you make them have babies. And when he took two of his, the, his hybrid peas, the ones that he produced in that first cross, and he crossbred them, white flowered peas and purple flowered peas appeared together in the second generation. He got a mix of white flowered and purple flowered peas. So think about this. Whatever it is that is making this pea plant up here have white flowers seems to have skipped a generation somehow. It must have somehow been hiding in this first generation. We didn't see it, but it must have somehow come back in order to make some of that second generation have white flowers. Hmm, interesting. There must be some kind of thingamabob in these white flowered pea plants that gives them white flowers and that can be hidden in the first generation, but then get passed on and show up again in the second generation. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. That's interesting. By the way, there, when we talk about experiments like this, there's actually a standard abbreviation scheme, and I'm going to use it a lot. Um, if we do an experiment where we crossbreed uh, two different uh, varieties of something, be they pea plants or whatever, the parents that we cross to start our experiment off are called the P generation, and the P stands for parental. The offspring that we get collectively make up the F1 generation, and F in this case stands for filial. Uh, filial comes from the Latin word for offspring, uh, for, uh, uh, for either daughter or for son. A son in Latin is filius, a daughter is filia. Filial means offspring, child, son or daughter. So the first cross we did was the parental generation or the P generation. The offspring we got from them was the F1 generation or the first filial. We usually just say F1. And when we crossbred two members of the F1 generation, the resulting plants that we got were the F2 generation or second filial generation. And if we wanted to, we could take some of these down here at the bottom of the slide and crossbreed them and create the F3 generation, F4, F5, however long we wanted to go. So know what those terms mean. It makes it a whole lot easier to describe what you're doing. So Mendel concluded from his first crosses that there must be some kind of thingy, some kind of, Mendel called them elements, some kind of particles, some kind of little thingamabobs rattling around inside those plant cells that made the peas look the way that they do. There was some sort of little thingamahoochers inside pea plant cells that made them grow purple flowers or white flowers. Now, there were others that proposed that inheritance was more like a blend. 
that instead of little particles, inheritance was more like mixing paint. Uh, maybe plant cells contain some kind of fluids that make the flowers look either purple or white. Mendel couldn't find any evidence for that. Um, you know, you could mix purple paint and white paint, but you'd never get the white paint back out of the, the, the mixture once you had mixed it. But here we cross a purple flowered plant and a white flowered plant and the F1s are all purple, but white pops up again in the F2 generation, right? There's no way you could mix liquids and then get some of the liquid that you first mixed in to pop back out, right? I put some honey in my tea this morning and stirred it a lot. And there's no way I'm getting the honey back out of the cup once it's stirred in. But that is what you see when you crossbreed pea plants. So Mendel concluded that heredity was not like mixing liquids. It must be, as we say, particulate. There's some sort of particles in these plant cells that make them look the way that they do. Now, when Mendel crossed a purple flowered parent and a white flowered parent, all of the offspring were purple. But then in their offspring, the white flower color showed back up. So we say that the trait of purple flower color is dominant to the trait of white flower color. And the opposite, white flower color is recessive to purple flower color. That doesn't mean that purple flower color is better in any way. It doesn't mean that purple flower color is normal. It doesn't mean that it's healthy. It doesn't mean that it's common. It doesn't mean that it's tougher. You know, purple flower colored peas do not beat up on white flower colored peas and take their lunch money or any, anything like that. All that it means is that when you cross a purple flowered plant and a white flower plant, the purple color, this little purple element, whatever it is, masks the white element, it hides it, it covers up the presence. But white elements, whatever they are, may reappear in future generations. So purple masks white. And that's what we mean when we say that purple flower color is dominant and white flower color is recessive. Okay, dominant doesn't mean better. Dominant does not mean more awesome, dominant does not mean healthier. Dominant just means covers up a recessive trait. That's all. For right now, we don't even need to know why that happens, just that it does. Just that if you cross a purple flowered pea and a white flowered pea, the F1s all look purple, but white pops up in the F2 generation. So whatever thing it is that's making the make pea plants white, it must be, it must pass through the F1 generation, but its presence must be masked by the presence of the purple element. Okay, and it turned out that the other six pairs of traits that Mendel studied worked in the same way. Uh, round seeds in peas was dominant to wrinkled seeds. Uh, yellow seeds is dominant to green seeds. Uh, green pods is uh, dominant to uh, yellow pods. Um, inflated pods, oh yeah, so dominant doesn't mean darker either. Not necessarily, no. Um, there might be, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. It, it all depends on the species that you're working with. Doesn't dominant mean that it's just more likely to show up? Um, not even that. Uh, there are a lot of cases where we have a uh, where we have something that's dominant and yet very rare. Um, one example from humans. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but one. Okay, the reason you ought to care about a bunch of damn pea plants is that 
humans, and in fact, most eukaryotes play by exactly the same rules. Um, what is true for these pea plants, the rules that Mendel worked out apply to an awful lot of other species, including humans. And the human example I can think of is there is a very nasty condition called Huntington's disease. It tends to strike in your middle age, about, you know, in your 30s, 40s, 50s. And it's a slow but progressive loss of uh, muscle control. Uh, you slowly lose the ability to, uh, to walk and ultimately to speak and you end completely helpless. That's caused by what we call a dominant allele. Um, fortunately for humanity, it's also quite rare. Um, the vast majority of, of humans don't, uh, don't suffer from Huntington's disease. Um, so yeah, dominant does not necessarily mean common. Um, I can tell you that most garden peas that I've ever grown have white flowers. Uh, I'm not sure what wild peas would have looked like, uh, but certainly if you buy peas at your average garden store today, they're almost certainly going to grow into white flowered varieties. So dominant does, has nothing to do with whether a trait is common or rare. Okay, now this is all interesting, but so far it's not that new. Um, in fact, back in 1751, a French guy by the name of Maupertuis had studied a family that had a family history of polydactyly, which is the medical term for having more than five fingers on a hand and or more than five toes on a foot. Uh, this is an x-ray of a child uh, born with an extra finger. And Maupertuis had studied this family uh, he had made a record of their family tree. He'd worked out who in the family had had extra fingers. And he had also showed that in humans, polydactyly can skip generations um, in exactly the same way that white flower color can skip generations in, in peas. Uh, like Mendel, he thought that this trait must be caused by some sort of hereditary particles some little thingamabobs rattling around inside human cells that causes people to be born with either five fingers or in some cases, more than five fingers. So this is interesting, but so far it's not that new. What's new is that first of all, Mendel crossbred lots and lots and lots of pea plants He found that some traits would skip a generation and then reappear. More importantly, he counted the number of pea plants in every generation. When he crossed a true breeding purple flowered pea plant with a true breeding white flowered pea plant, all of the offspring were purple flowered. But when he took two of those F1 plants and bred them with each other, will leave out the fact that he was breeding pea plants with each other that were brother and sister. Uh, don't think about that too hard. When he crossbred these F1s with each other, his F2 generation included 705 purple flowered plants and 224 white flowered plants for a total of 929. That's very close to three times as many purple flowered plants in the F gener F2 generation as there are white flowered plants. That's very close to a ratio of three to one. And he observed the same thing in his other F2 crosses. Uh, you certainly do not need to memorize these numbers, but there were almost always exactly three plants with the dominant trait for every one plant with the recessive trait if you do enough counting. Were there cases where it would skip more than one generation? Um, you can cause that to happen in the crosses that Mendel was doing, not... <sighs> In the crosses that Mendel was doing, let's not worry about that. 
um, yeah, it turns out you could take some of the F2 plants that were both purple and crossbreed them and they would have some offspring that had white flowers. So in some cases, if you take two of the F2s and you crossbreed them to get a generation that we call F3, some of those would end up being white. Um, let's not worry about that just yet. Let me go through a little bit more material before we get there. Good question. Hold on to that for a bit. Okay, Mendel looked, actually, I think I'm about to answer your, your question in a little more detail. Mendel looked more closely at the plants in the F2s and tried letting them self. Remember that if you just grow peas and you completely leave them alone, uh, the, uh, the anthers inside that flower will produce pollen and fertilize their own egg cells. And um, the plant will, uh, yeah, the plant can, can reproduce completely on its own. So he found that the white flowered plants in the F2 generation would only produce more white flowered plants for as long as Mendel kept on going. Uh, every white flowered plant in the F2 generation bred true. There was no sign that any of his descendant plants had ever had a purple flowered ancestor. The F2 gets weirder. One third of the purple flowered plants in the F2 generation also produce nothing but more purple flowered plants. They were true breeding, as we say. Look, computer animation. But two thirds of the purple flowered plants in the F2 generation, whoops, were not true breeding. They would produce purple flowered and white flowered plants in that three to one ratio. And to answer your question, if you were to take um, like this flower, and that flower and crossbreed them with each other, you'd end up getting the same mix of purples and whites. So if you crossbreed those, then the white shows up in the F3 generation. So this is weird. Not all of the purple flowered plants in the F2 generation are identical. Some of those F2s, if you let them breed, will only produce more purple flowered plants. But some of those purples in the F2 generation will produce both purple and white plants if you let them reproduce. So how do we put this all together? Goes like this. There are some kind of elements rattling around inside P cells that determine what traits the peas have. Now, Mendel's word for these was elements or elementen, since he wrote in German. Uh, we now call these elements genes. We will be going into much more agonizing detail as to exactly what genes are and what they do, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. We don't yet, okay, this is where we've got like a black box like you did in lab one, uh, except for those of you that had to miss it. You know, we don't yet know what's inside this sealed box labeled gene. And for the next few lectures, we're going to be rattling that box quite a bit to try to unpack what's inside it. But for right now, we don't really need to know what a gene is. We will get to that. All that we know about genes right now is that a gene can exist in several forms and the different forms of the same gene are called alleles. So there is a gene for pea flower color. That gene comes in two alleles. There's a purple allele and there's a white allele. And different alleles of the same gene may be dominant or recessive. The per, in the example we've talked about, the purple flowered allele is dominant to the white flowered allele. 
Now, in all the examples I've shown you, each gene has exactly two alleles. Uh, the P gene for flower color comes in either the purple allele or the white allele. Um, the peas themselves may be either green or yellow because they may be carrying either green alleles or yellow alleles of the gene for pea seed color and so on. Now, genes often do have, some genes have only one allele. They're not that interesting. There are other genes that may have three alleles, four alleles, or many more alleles. We'll talk about that later. Know for right now that it's not always a case where every gene comes in only two different forms. Um, there are lots of cases where there's more than two, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. So every pea plant, Mendel reasoned, has two copies of each gene, and each plant got one gene from each of its parents. The two copies may happen to be of the same allele, or the two copies may be different alleles. Uh, when a plant's two copies of a gene are both the same, we call that plant homozygous. Homo is uh, Greek for same. Zygous comes from the word for a yoke. And if you don't know, a yoke is a type of harness that's used to link uh, two cattle or two horses together uh, when they're pulling your carts or pulling your plow. That's a yoke. And we use it a lot just to mean two things that are linked together, two things that are paired. Yoke, Y-O-K-A. -E. So homozygous means two of the same thing that are yoked together. And when a pea plant's two copies of a gene are of different alleles, we call that plant heterozygous. Heteros is just Greek for being different different things yoked together. Alleles may be dominant or recessive. There's actually some other possibilities, but let's not get sidetracked right now. And the only thing that a dominant allele does is it will cover up the existence of a recessive allele if one is present. So those F1P plants had one dominant purple allele and one recessive white allele they all looked purple because purple was dominant. And all that means is that the purple allele masked the white allele, covered up the fact that a white allele was there. Dominant doesn't mean better or superior or anything like that. All it means is that it tends to cover up a recessive. And I'm gonna go ahead and break it off there. And the last thing I'll add is that the reason this ought to matter, and the reason that Mendel is such an important figure in biology, is that it's not only pea plants that do this. With some variation, uh, pretty much all eukaryotes play by these rules, and we can identify genes with dominant and recessive alleles in animals, in fungi, in protists, Bacteria get a little weird for reasons that we'll have to look at much later, uh, but virtually all eukaryotes follow Mendel's rules. Uh, the same rules that you can use to determine whether a pea plant is going to have purple or white flowers can be used to determine whether your baby is going to have muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis uh, or not. So think about that if you're really sick of pea plants. You follow the same rules as pea plants in the inheritance of your own genes. And we'll look at some examples of that after we finish covering uh, Mendel's work. But for right now, I'm going to stop the recording.